All right, so apparently Moodle is still giving uh, bad notifications. So I'm recording uh, the lecture today. Let me apologize for that confusion. Uh, we definitely were not supposed to be canceled today. All right. So, <laughs> to my audience of two, I'm going to try not to overfocus on you. I won't call you any pretty questions. But today we're going to talk a little bit more about push down automaton. It's still important to think about this in the context of where we stand as a class. This is a set of all languages. In the middle, we have this smaller, th this smaller set called the regular languages. DFAs are what provide us the look into to decide what belongs in this set, what provides set membership. We have a larger set called the context-free languages. Now, the regular languages are a subset of the context-free languages, and we covered that a little bit on Monday. But the key pieces for determining set membership are push down automaton and the context free grammar. Today we're going to practice on context free grammars so that we can, I'm sorry, not context free grammar, push down automaton so that we can get some good practice on the intuition behind context free languages. All right, so the language I want to start with is the one that we did on the board on Monday. We had initial state, we moved over to an intermediate state, down to another inter intermediate state, and over to a single final state. This was the language A to the N, B to the N, but every PDA that I write at the beginning I push on to our stack a dollar sign, and I pop off the stack a dollar sign at the end. This is a little trick that I do for all PDAs. It helps me understand and try to come up with a solution. PDAs are inherently non-deterministic. So in the one that we had as in our first example, we had a single loop here that for every A that we read from the input string, we didn't pop anything, but we pushed a pound sign. We took the transition from A's to B's non-deterministically, and for every B, we popped off a pound, and we didn't push anything. This is for the language a to the N, B to the N. And it focuses on the two primary, yeah. Moodle sent out a notification that class was canceled. It totally wasn't canceled. So you were in the right place. I'm just recording for everybody. It takes advantage of the two criteria for acceptance. First, that it's the end of the input string. I'm sorry, there's actually two. End of input string ends on an accepting state. And three, it has an empty stack. Now, it's very important when you're practicing PDAs to go through and see how they work. Get a sense of how they operate. Because these PDAs, they all use the, the same approach. And, and in this case, the stack has one very specific purpose. The stack is sitting off here to the side. When we start at Q0, it pushes on a dollar sign. Now, what I want you to see is that if we have a string like A, 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 B, 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 B. I don't want to loop through the PDA and go from here to here, from here over here, from here to here. I don't want all that stuff. I want to just go through it 
at a high level. When we start at the initial state, we get to our QA. And for every A that we read in our input string, we push on a pound. So if we read one, two, three, four A's, we push four pounds onto the stack. We, we know when to go here because there's this like invisible line where we know non-deterministically we're going from reading A's at this one to reading B's at this intermediate state. And you know for every time we read a B, we pop off a pound sign. And once we're done reading the B's, we pop off that bottom of the stack marker and we're done. We've reached the input, end of the input string, we're on a final state, and we are also with an empty stack. But what's important is to notice what these four pounds mean. This shows how the stack can be used for a counter. It's counting the number of A's. And then it will count the number of B's by destroying the number of A's. So that's how that works. Sorry, small crowd today. Moodle had like a, a bad announcement from like two weeks ago and it's sent out apparently. So uh, sorry for the confusion. It uses a stack to count things. So let's look at another language. Today we're gonna to be looking at this language. Palindrome. And we look at the strings that we would accept. And I want some of the longer ones because it's going to help us solve what the problem is. Things like A, A, B, B, A, A. Or A, B, B, A. Or B, A, B, A, A, B, A, B. Each one of these belong in palindrome because... Backwards, forwards, it's the same. Palindrome, it is its name. But we have to use the stack to solve this. Now, it's not as easy as counting. So I want you to think, if this is our stack over here to the side, If this is our stack over here to the side, I want you to think on your own for just a moment about what that stack can be used for. How can we use the stack to solve this problem? Mm. See, we're not just counting anymore, we're matching. We're matching. I wanna get this off. I wanna, I wanna just focus on this side. I want us to think about it like a puzzle. Think about it like you're in 390 and that I'm at Dr. McDowell right now, okay? All right, I'll try to, try to mimic Dr. McDowell. What have we got? What can we think of to solve this? Well, let's think of the stack. The stack is LIFO. Last in, first out. It's different from a Q where it's first in, first out. All right, I got an idea. Think about it this way. As you're reading in the string, and I'm not, no PDAs here. No, I'm thinking about it like a 390 problem. I'm thinking about it from like a, a data structures. How can we use a stack to solve this? All right, so let's imagine we're doing this. We read in an A, and we want the stack to make sure that it matches what? The last A. We want to read that A, and then we want to do the second to last A, and this B, and this B. So imagine if we wrote a machine that did this. It reads an A, 
So it pushes something to let us know there's an A there. Now for the sake of confusion, let's not use an A, let's use an at sign. And then we see another one and we have an at sign. And then we see a B and we push a pound sign. Look what we can do. We can, in that magical middle point, we can pop off the pound, pop off the at, pop off the at, and we have a working solution. Let's see that working again here. A, B, B, A. We're reading in, we push on an at, we push on a pound, that magical point in the middle, we pop off a pound, we pop off an at. Let's see it here. A B, we push on a pound. Now let's think about it at a higher level. What are we matching this to? The last in, I'm sorry, the first in will be the last out. So it'll match this to this. Then we push on an at. Then we push on a pound. And then we push on an at. And in this magical halfway point, we pop off the at, pop off the B, pop off the at, pop off the B. Now, this means that we could possibly use this stack not just to count, but to match letters on the front end and the back end. Are y'all worried about this little magical place in the middle? Good. Okay. Palindrome should always be accepted. Yeah, palindrome should always be accepted. So Jonathan says no, and he's right, because just like A to the N, B to the N, we use non-determinism for where that magical middle place is, that magical, magical middle place. Let's see if this approach might work for when things aren't so good. Let's take a language, or I'm sorry, a string that's not in the language, like B, a, 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 Ba, right? The second we read in a B, we push on a hash. I'm sorry, a pound. So if we go to the halfway point in the string, then we put on an at. Then we push off an at. And we can't go. It says no. On the second half of the string, it has to match the stack. So what we just did, believe it or not, is we understood the problem. We came up with a solution. How can we use a stack to solve this? The stack we have split into two points, the push and the pop. No different than A to the N, B to the N. The only difference is that we need the at and the pound. I'm sorry, had that wrong. At, at, pound, pound, at, at. So we, as we build up our intuitions, you're going to see a lot of things that look a lot alike. So let's look at the solution for this. If I have an initial state, in my previous example, the first things that I did was I pushed on a dollar sign. And the last thing I did was to pop it off. That's not going to change. But I still have two intermediate states here. For this one, I have, we're going to call it Q1 and Q2. And just like before, the key piece, piece that Jonathan brought up, we're going to have right here in the middle a non-deterministic switch between each one. Now, the challenge that I want to give you is I want you to think about what Q1 and Q2 does. What do they do? This one pushes and this one pops. 
This one records the first half of the string, and this one matches the second half of the string. Records, matches, pushes, pops. The rest of it, this was just the same thing as A to the N, B to the N. I didn't change anything. So since I didn't change anything, now we're applying a, a problem that we've seen before to something new. So as we think about Q1, Q1 is pushing. It's pushing on. It's recording. How do we do that? Let's think about it in terms of if statements. We come here at Q0. We go over. The first thing that we do is we push on the dollar sign. From there, we're at Q1. We're right here. We go through, we, we model the same processes that we did with our finger earlier. We're at Q1. That means we're reading the first half. If I read an A, what do I do? I push an A. And I don't pop anything. I'm not popping anything. The way this looks is it looks like this. If I read an A, I don't pop anything. I push an A. Since all we're doing is pushing, that's all we're going to ever do. We're going to push. We're going to record. This is the first half of the string. We're recording the first half of the string. The next transition, you might imagine what that transition would be. I'm reading an A, so I push on an F. I read an A, I take that loop, so I push on an F. But now I'm here. The next character in my string is a B. The transitions look like this. Read in, what we have to pop, and what we have to push, all right? I have to read in the next character. It's not an A, it's a B. I'm not gonna pop anything. This is the half of the string where we're recording what the string is gonna have. So we're pushing it. We're pushing onto the sack, so we don't pop anything. But instead, we push. Does it matter what we push? Yes. Because I have to differentiate between A's and B's. It's not A to the N, B to the N. If we're going to be matching it, I want the next one to be a B. So I'm going to push on the pound. So the last one, the last one, we read the B and we push on a pound. Now, it's at this point I want to stop. In, in our brains, our intuition, we've reached the halfway point. And yes, that's when we take this non-deterministic halfway point. You can run through it in your head. What happens if you go through here again? It's gonna, you're going to have a bad time. We're more interested in what does work, and we know that won't work. If you didn't have this string at all, and you know that it's a last in, first out, do you know what the second half of that string should be? It's B, A, A. Not A, A, B, because it's from the top down. Pop off the B, pop off the A, pop off the A. Intentionally messing up with those characters there. B, A, A. Pound, at at. So the second half of the string should be that. But how do we model that? When we're on the side of popping, we're going to have two transitions here. I want you to take a moment and think about what these transitions are going to be. If we read an A, what do we do? If we read a B, what do we do? I want you to fill those out right now. Where you, wherever you are, if you're watching in a recording, whatever it is, fill out those four blanks. As a hint, the state is named POP.
Just push on the bottom of the stack. That's the book. Read an A, push an F. Read a B, push a pound. Halfway through, we take our non-deterministic transition through here, just whenever we feel like it. Here we read an A, read a B. If you're not sure, we did A, A, B right here. A, A, B, and we're right here. Our next character is going to be a B. Fill in those four blanks. All right, when we read an A, when we read a B, they should have different effects. Real quick, this is the pop. Are we gonna be pushing anything here? Nope. So we can go ahead and put these empty strings. Empty strings at this point in the notation, you can think of as the word nothing. I know we've said empty string, I know we've said that it means, but for this, for, for right now, let's just think of it as we're not going to do anything. We're not going to push anything. But right here with this character, the last character we read was a B, so we pushed in a pound. Last in, first out. When we read a B, what do we want to pop out? We want to pop out the pound sign. This means that the last one we read has to be popped. In a sense, we kind of covered this part now. It's almost too easy for here, but when we read an A, the next A, what should we expect to be on top of the stack? If we've already popped this pound, it's the at sign. We take the loop again, we take another at sign, take another at sign, and then finally, we'd be at the end of our string and take our dollar sign away. This is the solution process for PDAs. This is the approach that we take when trying to solve them. To look at one that doesn't work, let's start here. BAA, we gotta start here. We immediately go over, the first thing that we do is we push on a dollar sign. We get to push for Q1. We push on a pound, taking this transition and reading our B. We push on an at, taking this transition and putting on an at. Now, on the halfway point of the string, I'm gonna take the non-determinism, okay? Now you might ask why am I always gonna do it on the halfway? Because we know one side pushes and one side pull, push, pops, right? So if I keep going here, I'm not gonna be able to pop off all the things in the stack and it's gonna fail because there'll be, still be things in the stack. I'm not gonna go here beforehand because this requires for us to get to the end of the string but we'll crack characters that aren't gonna be on the stack. So literally the stack makes it to where the halfway point has to be here. All right, so we get, we've done B and A, you can see it on the stack, B and A. First in is gonna be the last out. Last in is gonna be the first out. Halfway point, we come down to Q2. We read in our A and we successfully pop the at. And then we look right here, our last character is an A. Do you see that we can't take this transition? We read in an A, we pop an at. We can't pop an at. We know that we can't, so we can't take this transition. But we can take this transition where it says we read in nothing and we pop a dollar. Can I pop a dollar sign? No. 
It's not at the top. I can't get rid of it. I can't just make it go away. So we're stuck and we failed. It doesn't work. But there's still a problem. Backwards, forwards, it's the same. Taco Cat, it is his name. Taco Cat would fail. Even if we allowed for it. To give you an example using the alphabet we have, what about the string? A, A, B, A, A. Right now it doesn't work. Right now it doesn't work. But is that a palindrome? Yep. Backwards, forwards, it's the same. Abba is its name. All right. The problem is, I can't draw the halfway line here. I have to draw it here or here. So let's say I do it this way. And I push on the dollar sign. And I push on an at, and I push on an at, and I go down here and I try to read the B, and I can't. There's no dollar sign to pop off. So obviously that didn't work. Let's try it here. And I'll push on the at, push on the at, push on the pound. And then I'll go down from the push to the pop, and I get an A, and I can't do anything with it. So this is a problem. Our last little bit of palindrome. PDAs, PDAs. For context-free languages, the way we know that it's not regular is if it requires counting, or in this case, matching. The stack in this case is matching the first half of the string to the second half of the string. Let me, let me draw this out for you. If I had the string A, B, B, A, this is the push, this is the pop. We're matching this one to this one, and this one to this one. Does that make sense? We're matching this half and this half. Now in this string, we're matching this one to this one. We're matching this one to this one. Which one are we matching that to? None of them. We're not matching B with Dilly Squat. It stands on its own. It's the middle character. So, should that B ever be on the stack? The answer to this is that since I don't care about the B, we push and we pop. This does mean that we draw our magical line right down the middle of the B. We're not matching that B to anything else. The stack allows us to match, and we don't want to match the B. So think about where we might handle this. If you're thinking non-determinism, nope, not here. We're not going to make an A that we can ignore. We're going to have all kinds of problems. This state does one thing and it pushes. And there can only be one character in the middle. We can't do it here because then it breaks the machine. We just want to make sure that one character in the middle. When do we take this transition? Right in the middle of the string. So check this out. What if we allowed an A or B to be the middle character. This is the solution. Now you have to test it. You have to check it out. But y'all, that's tough. That's hard. We ignore that middle character. Any questions on that?
that last little bit is the tough part. And I apologize in advance, that's what makes palindrome a hard problem, is that one little middle character can be very, very tough. So, like when we have only one letter that we want to repeat, and now there will always be more. So, let's check for one. If we have, let's double check everything. That's a really good point. We should check a lot of that. The empty string is a palindrome. Nothing backwards is nothing. We push on a dollar sign, we go here, we pop off the dollar sign. Without reading a character, we ended up with the final state. That was good. For A, if there's one path that leads to success, we're good. So we push on a dollar sign, we read in the A, and we pop it, and we push on an at, we go down to here, and we're stuck. That didn't work. So instead, we go over here, and all we need is the one path. We go over here, and instead of reading that A on this transition, we read this transition. We go here. We're at the end of the string, so we can't read A. We can't read B. So we go over here. We pop the dollar sign. It gets accepted. So A and B would be accepted the same way. A, A, in this case, it's almost like you see the even right there. So you know that that non-determinism will work. We push on the dollar sign, our first A. We push on an at. We take the non-determinism between the two. We pop the at. We pop the dollar sign, this is accepted. A, 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 our big hint. Our middle character is going to have that line right down the middle. So that means we're not going to use non-determinism. Q0 over, we push on a dollar sign. We get to Q sub 1. We read in an A. We push on an at. Because the line is right in the middle, we read in our A. We go through that. We get to Q2. We read in our A and we pop the at. We're at the end of that input string. We pop the dollar sign, and that's accepted. Does that answer your question? Awesome. It's always, always good to challenge these PDAs because believe it or not, teachers are not perfect. Any questions? All right, so I'm going to leave you with a challenge problem, and then I'm going to briefly introduce where we're going to go from this. I'm going to give you a language, and I want you to try to solve this on your own. The language L containing strings A to the I, B to the J, C to the K, where I is equal to J, or I is equal to K. I want you to solve this. On your own, outside of class, it's an excellent example of how we can use non-determinism. The first thing you have to understand is what's involved in this language. A, A, any number of Bs, C, C. This is I is equal to 2, B is equal to 4, and, I'm sorry, J is equal to 4, and K is equal to 2. You see why? Because A to the I, there's two A's, so that's 2. B to the J, there's four Bs, so J is equal to 4. 
C is equal to 2. So what this means is that the A's and B's have to be the same, or the A's and C's have to be the same. A's and B's, or A's and C's, have to be the same. That's super important to understand. And once we understand the problem, I'm going to give you a hint about where to go with this. If I have an initial state, I can use non-determinism in a very, very quirky way. All right? I'm going to read in nothing, pop nothing, and push on the dollar sign. Y'all know what that is? That is our bottom of the stack marker. I'm going to have a Q sub A right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read in A's. I'm going to pop nothing. I'm going to push a pound sign. But then... I am going to have a QB1 and a QB2, and I'm going to non-deterministically take both. With that start, I want you to see if you can finish this PDA. That's the direction that I want you to take for your practice problem. PDAs are very similar to NFAs. You look for ways non-determinism can solve the problem. The big hint that I can give to you is that never forget that you're working with a stack. Just like palindrome allowed us to match the first half of the string with the second half of the string. In this case, we're using the stack to count the number of A's and then using non-determinism to figure out if the number of A's matches the number of B's or matches the number of C's. So maybe we don't give a dang about the number of B's here. Maybe we don't give a dang about the number of C's here. But in either case, it should work. Is this string uh, accepted? A, A, B, B, C, C, that accepted? Yeah, ors are inherently inclusive. If it was an exclusive or, it would say exclusively or. So yeah, that should, that's, that should be accepted. All right, so that's your challenge. That will be what we start with next Monday. The main thing we're doing next Monday is going back to our list of context-free languages. In the list of context-free languages, there were PDAs, push down automaton, the push down automaton, and there was another one, the context-free grammar. Now, for context-free grammars, it's funny. Somebody once asked me, like, what does the word context-free mean? And I was like, oh, dang. I've been teaching this class for three years. I never thought about that question. And I had to think about it. What does the word context-free mean? So as we move forward, as we move forward with this piece, I want you to think about what the word context-free might mean. Because context-free grammars are very interesting. They use this thing called productions. Rules, productions, lots of stuff. But they look something like this.
something like this. This is an example of a very simple context-free variable. They use these production rules that go from left to right or right to left. The things inside of brackets are called non-terminals. It means we don't stop there. It really means it's non-terminal. We don't stop. We can stop. We won't stop. Right, come on. So yeah, that was horrible. I need. I feel like I need to play Molly Cyrus to get that correct tone. Anyway, no, no Molly Cyrus or Molly Cyrus. All right. What about Hannah Montana? Can I play a little Hannah Montana? No? Sure. I feel yeah. like I feel like those two are very similar artists. They have a very similar background. So, all right. <laughs> you got the best of both worlds. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Now we're just off the rails completely. All right. If y'all want to know the point that Dr. Burris went completely insane, that was it. Pinpoint. All right. <laughs> Non-terminals. We don't stop. Uh, so we start here at a starting non-terminal. Look at this. We can think about, I called it a production first. And S produces an A and B. And S produces an A and a B. Do we stop? Nope. Can't stop. A's give us either a lowercase a, a terminal a, or a non-terminal a, or a terminal a. So check this out. If I choose to take this first one, I can go non-terminal, oh, that's a backwards, I'm sorry. Now see what I did? This a produces a terminal a, the non terminal A. Now, B, I wrote it like a shorthand. This means B can go to either lowercase b and a large b, the terminal b and the non terminal b, or it can go to the terminal b. It's the same thing as saying this up here. Now, if y'all had to choose one, and you know the Panda Express is right there waiting for you, we're going to choose that terminal b. Can we stop? Nope, we have a non-terminal right here. This gives you a preview of what CFGs are. It's only a preview. I don't expect you to know this, but I have a question. What language might this context-free grammar produce? Just on the little bit that we've shown, what do y'all think? Anybody got it? Yep. Any number of A's followed by any number of B's. A plus, B plus. So this is just a preview. We will go very, very slowly in what these are. You might ask, why did I show a preview of this? Okay, here's why. Regular languages had DFAs and NFAs, and then it also had this other thing. You remember the other thing? Regular expressions? They expressed the strings, they were a different approach. Uh, well, this, the context-free grammar, the CFG, they're like regular expressions are. They're how we express context-free languages. And they're very, very useful. I'm gonna put a production here. A very simple production. This is a context for grammar for A to and B to the end. This is a way to express a context-free language. So these things are incredibly powerful. 
and incredibly difficult to get the hang of. So I want you to get that thought in your head, the idea that this is like a regular expression, but more difficult. This also comes to a very important part of why theory of computation is important, right? Theory of computation is very, very important because every language you've ever spoken or used has a grammar. And it is a context-free grammar. It is absolutely a context-free grammar. So when we get back on Monday, we're going to explore context-free grammars. We're first going to use the English language. And we're going to create a grammar for the English language. Not all of the English language, but a very, very small portion of the English language. We're going to talk about someone who's very important to the field of computer science who you may not know as being related to computer science, and in fact, he has no degree in computer science, Noam Chomsky, known more for politics and history and language and linguistics than he is for computer science, but he tried to use these for computer science. So we're gonna learn about the work of Noam Chomsky as it relates to theory of computer science. But this is incredibly relevant. Have you ever wondered why your compiler can put a red squiggly line when you mess up. The grammar, the syntax, syntax are the rules of your language. Rules, this syntax is defined by grammar, right? The syntax is defined by grammar, right? That's why you know fish bad. No, that's not a sentence. We know that because you can't diagram it. It doesn't fit the grammar. It doesn't, there's a grammatical error. It was bad syntax. The same thing is true in a language. So here IDEs are. Yes, I'm using IDE, right? Yeah, IDEs are putting red squiggly lines when I mess up something. I might not remember a semicolon, but it'll tell me. Most of the time. It'll tell me if I mess up with a semicolon. but it can't tell me when I did something wrong with the program, like an infinite loop. It can't tell me if I made an infinite loop, but it can tell me the rules of the language. And what's messed up, what's super messed up, is if I have a variable declaration, and it's like int x equals five, I have a variable declaration and initialization. If I forget this semicolon, it's like, oh, no, you can't do that. You've got a red squiggly line here. And it says, you probably forgot a semicolon. It'll tell you, you probably forgot a semicolon. But if I do this, It's not going to give me a red squiggly line. This is bad wrong. This is badong, all right? This is super bad. But is it syntactically correct? Why is it that IDEs can see it here, but not here? This is where theory of computer science is actually relevant to you. It is super relevant to you because you will see why compilers can do that, but can't do much more simple tasks, like telling you if you've done messed up. Any questions about where we're going? Hopefully you don't understand this completely. Hopefully you're just getting a, a preview, all right? Any questions about what we did today? I apologize again for Moodle sending you an email about the class being canceled. My bad, no, not my bad, the Moodler did that. So, I appreciate, we went from two to six. I mean, the crowd's just coming in today. I appreciate you all, you all that stayed in. I know it's super uncomfortable being talked to for six people in the room. And you all changed your seats, except for Jonathan and Sneha. So, I appreciate you all clumping together, so it's not so wild out. All right, that's it for class today. Wesley Foundation has free lunch. Well, I actually make it today.